we have Brett Swartz here with me today, and you can learn what he is up to by heading over to his website, brettswartz.com. We're going to be talking about something near and dear to my heart is regarding negotiation, especially around what Mr. Voss has set forth in Never Split the Difference because you've gone through the master training a number of times. But again, it's brettswartz.com. So if you're looking for negotiation skills, this is your episode. So thanks for joining me here today, Brett. Jack, great to be on the show again. Pleasure to be here. Yeah, I'm going to have that link in the show notes from the previous time you you were on. But has, has your direction changed slightly since then? No, not at all. I just think it's good to solve problems in unique ways. And negotiation is a big part of everything we're doing. So besides capital gains tax solutions, what we're doing with, with capital gains tax deferral for clients, it's really what happens then, right? Afterwards, right? And how, how are we negotiating opportunities for them to invest? And as real estate entrepreneurs and investors, I think who are listening to the show, negotiation is one of those fundamental things that are key that we're always working on, we're always practicing because otherwise we just forget. And that's part of why I've taken that masterclass on the masterclass app with Chris Voss, I think 55 times, if I had to guess. And it's each time I'm learning a little bit more or practicing a little bit more and actually listen to it this morning again, it's become a, a big part of the values that we're trying to build at Capital Gains Tax Solutions. It's one of those things that for some reason, like a lot of people are partial to rich dad, poor dad. It's probably because of the way it's written in that type of parable form. What attracts you to that material to this extent? Yeah, I think it's, it starts with about 24 months ago, I found myself in very high stakes emotional negotiations with previous strategic alliances. You know, one in particular that I think sometimes, you know, the pain and the frustration of not being able to feel heard or feeling like you're getting traction with communication and business relationships moves us into the direction of increasing our skill set. And that's where I found myself after just, I think, really working with someone for years, you know, for years, and then just finding out like, what's really happening here? And, and instead of like being upset about it, it was more like, hey, well, how can I approach this in a different way with communication? And it's really what negotiation is, just great communication that tries to, you know, like Chris Voss has never split the difference. Like you're not just trying to one give in and one give out, like trying to find collaboration and connection without feeling like you're being steamrolled, right? And so that's where I dug into, I had read Chris's material years ago, but reading, I think for the entrepreneur sometimes is, you know, you retain, or really anybody, you retain 10, 15% of it. Then you write it down, you get maybe a little bit more, you try, try to teach it, you get about 90%, right? But to see it practically on the visual, masterclass video, that was powerful. That was really, really powerful. So it really just came from really the need, like need and the desire to communicate at a higher level that was creating win-win outcomes versus, you know, feeling like you might be getting a little bit more steamrolled, if that makes sense. Yeah. If you haven't read the book, I'm going to advise everybody to get that audio book or physical book as quickly as possible, because there is a lot of things, good communication. What are some of those things that you could point to right off the top of your head that you just didn't practice before that has had the biggest influence? Yeah, there's two, two major ones. And I'll touch on the first one. It's called mirroring. And the way that Chris Voss puts it is the, con the conscious repetition of counterparts' words. It's typically the last you know, few words that someone has just said. And so mirrors are designed to show the other side that you're listening and understanding them. But what I also found is it gives me time to slow down. You know, my type of personality type, I'm an extrovert, kind of a driven personality. And I, I, I thrive with people with, you know, and, and, and I get more energy. And that can be, for different personality types, it can be a little intense, right? So by mirroring, not only does it show that I'm actually listening, A, but also B, it gives me a chance to digest what they've said. And that's the key, right? And there are two types of mirroring. There's an invitation to say more, right? Because you're wanting to like learn a little bit more about it. The way Chris puts it, it's like an upward inflection. You know, it's like, you might say, had an amazing time watching the Olympics this weekend. And he might say, amazing time watching the Olympics. And it's kind of an upward like invitation for you to dive in more. And you might say, yeah, that's Sprinter. I mean, he won it at the last minute for the USA and he won the gold and he was going 100 miles an hour and you weren't sure if he's going to win. And now 
you shared a little bit more, we've connected a little bit more, and I actually got more information, which is ultimately part of why you're mirroring. You're trying to take the thread that someone has said, and you're trying to unweave it a little bit further. And the other type of mirroring is a declarative. This communicates that you're understanding your counterpart, right? So it, it might be a little bit more of a level type of inflection where it just is sort of like, you're getting what they're saying. So now you've, you, you might have ended that thought there. You're not necessarily asking them to go for more. You're kind of just ending the thought of like, oh, I had an amazing time watching Olympics. And you might say, yeah, you had an amazing time watching Olympics. You know, and, and so it's a little bit more downward inflection, if that makes sense. So that's kind of what I've gleaned. I may not be saying that perfectly, but that's, that's the first part of mirroring. And that's a great place to be in because it takes the pressure off of, especially if you're an introvert, and my wife's an introvert, it takes the pressure off of feeling like you have to respond or have a reaction. It's rather more of a neutral invitation to hear more of what someone is saying. Yeah. And, you know, when you say mirroring, I think a lot of people kind of default to the concept that, you know, you're mirroring body gestures and, and a few other things. But Chris kind of goes into it a bit more deeper than that and, and to help construct the conversation. Right. So I think the traditional mirroring is if someone crosses the legs, you cross the legs, they cross the arms, you cross the arms, or you do a little bit of the opposite, you know, and that piece of it. I think there's definitely value there, right? If someone's sitting down, it's probably wise to not just stand up and talk to them. It's probably better to sit down or if your child is, you know, you're going to talk to a kid, you don't want to be standing over the top. You want to lean down and get down to their level. So there's a lot of, I think, wisdom there. But yeah, I think he's taking it the next of, of mirroring the words that they're saying, but I think also the tonality in which they're saying it. And so, and I think we do this naturally a lot of times, but sometimes we don't do it naturally or we're not being intentional about it. And then when we're not intentional about it, that's probably why we're losing some of that connection. If you're feeling like, why am I not connecting with that person? Well, maybe they're not feeling heard. Okay, well, here's a tactical way to build empathy, which is mirroring their tone, their their body language, but most of it, Chris says, is there is what they actually said, right? Because that connects the neurons in your head. Basically, it helps to connect the two people. So you mentioned that there was two things that come to mind. Were those the two things, or was there a secondary? So that's the first one. So the second one is called labeling, and this one is even more powerful. Chris says this is his the one that's the most durable and the one that is the most efficient way to build connection and empathy. And it's called labeling. And so labeling, the way it, he defines it, is verbally acknowledging the other side's feelings and positions and using some of the words like it sounds like, it feels like, it seems like. Labels are powerful tools for reinforcing positive feelings and deactivating negative ones. I tend to like the word, I tend to like using it sounds like or it feels like. And depending on the person you're connecting with, they might be more higher on the feelings for making decisions or higher on the feelings for how they express their emotions. The other side might be higher on the logic, right? Higher on the thinking, less emotional. So I think it's, if in a dynamic way, if you could kind of see, are they more feeling or are they more sounding? But also you want to listen to the words they're actually saying, right? If they're coming with some strong emotion, what I found that's so powerful with this, especially if you're in a high stakes negotiation or high stakes, just relationship, you know, conflict, right? Where there's something happening where you're feeling like the emotion has been pressed on you, right? Facts have been stated, you know, basically judgments, you know, and you're feeling like, oh man, and you feel like, you know, the intensity is rising. You maybe start to sweat a little bit. Your heart starts to race a little bit in the defense, you know, the fight or flight starts to kick in. And so I literally remember being on phone calls feeling helpless in a little way, you know, before this type of training, feeling, especially when the other side are really big talkers and they just keep talking and talking and talking and talking. You're feeling like, are they ever going to be quiet or are they ever going to give me a chance to speak or to, you know, and it could go on for five, 10, and 20 and not even take a breath. And you're just like, and it's just pouring and pouring and pouring. And so that before, I think, tactical empathy, before mirroring and labeling, especially before labeling, it always felt like somebody, like I was almost in debt, like somebody just poured out their heart, their emotions, all of these things. It's almost like it felt like I was in debt to have an opinion or a strong emotion. But 
there was so much said in this past 5, 10, 15, 20, 30, sometimes 30 minutes. Like I remember sitting on the call, putting it on mute, setting it down, like, wow, like this is a lot going on right now. Like this is not a conversation. This is really just a one-sided conversation is a better way to think about it. Okay, so in the past, I didn't really know what to start. I kind of felt helpless. I felt like it was on me. With labeling, what happens, it's like jujitsu. Like, you know, let me also take another step back. Before I'd have to feel like maybe I have to take another, like a punch. Like I'd have to like kind of like fight back. Like, oh my gosh, she said so much. Maybe he threw like 10 emotional blows and three, you know, half facts. And whoa, he really missed that thing there. And so it became like, how do I even like respond to this? Like there's so many angles, right? And then even then when you would respond, it tended to go now down another rabbit hole or another like one-sided conversation. So the point is the leverage and the control and the emotion was, was really heavy. So instead of trying to fight back, trying to take my stand or trying to, you know, uh, you know, be heard. I actually learned through labeling that you can mirror the emotion and summarize a little bit of what was said. And it's like jujitsu. So instead of like throwing fists, it's like using the energy. The technique is using the, the opponent's uh, you know, as leverage, right? And using the energy as leverage and not fighting and holding on to just one way of doing things. So by mirroring and labeling, but especially I would label the emotion. So I would say something along the signs of, wow, it really feels like you see that like this, or it really feels like you feel this because of that. And, or it, it, it really sounds like, you know, X facts is because of this. And you're just simply neutral. You're not high or low. You're just repeating back that major point that they said with the major emotion that's underlining it. And you're trying to give a kind of a general summary. And I'm telling you, and, and if the person says that's right, that's when you know it's working because it helps to put it back onto them. And then you just stay quiet. You stay quiet and you give them an opportunity to do something now. It doesn't feel like it's on you. Is that making some sense there, Jack? Yeah, it does. And in fact, you've hit a, quite a few notes there. A lot of people, us in particular, we buy a lot of distressed property. And it it has allowed us, and, and it, this kind of fits certain personalities better than others. In my situation, you said you're an extrovert. I'm a bit of an introvert. So I do have a tendency of letting people just talk and talk and talk when they're calling in. And a lot of these jujitsu moves that you're talking about has allowed me to help them realize things or state things out loud that they've never admitted to anybody before. And it, in the end, you know, we may or may not buy, buy the property, but it helped, it definitely helped them come to a realization that they might not have had up until that point. Yeah, it's a great insight because I think a lot of times too, people think out loud and they feel out loud. They may not even know the feelings or the thoughts that they have until they're in the intense conversation. And now it's a lot of it subconsciously there until they're in that flow state that they actually, it, it gets revealed, right? This is a way of, of, of counseling as well. Counselors are asking really great questions. And when you make a declaration or you make a statement, you own that. But when you ask the question and they come to that same idea or, 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 or epiphany, they own it, right? And the goal should always be they own it. You don't want to force someone into something that you want. You want to try a collaborative way for them to discover that. And that is through the art of labeling and mirroring and asking calibrated questions, which is another one. But a lot of times we were taught, like I started Marcus and Melchap in the sales it was, it was taught that you would ask open-ended questions and there's whole, there's a spin selling method as well. There's these different things. All of those have their value for sure. And you use them, but I do feel that this is another level because it's not like every time you ask questions and the way Chris puts it is you, you tend to feel like you owe someone when they give you the answer. So even if I say, Hey Jack, what's your name? And you say, Jack, right? I, the reciprocal typical nature is now I owe Jack to say, if he asked me my name, I would say it back. So when you're in negotiations, when you're in communication, it, you know, the more, the more you ask, the more you tend to feel like you owe. So with labeling and in mirroring, you're not actually asking questions. You're just making statements 
that are either encouraging more to be said, which then you could find the true wants or needs. And then when they, when something is said, you can start to dig there, right? So it's almost like digging for valuable information so that you can add value. So it is really about them, right? Versus just asking the questions that you want answered. So it's actually, you know, again, this is not just negotiation. This is just communication 101. I'll also throw in one little thing here on this that I've learned is a lot of times we want to find a reason why we connect with somebody like, hey, Jack, where are you from? And you're like, California. I'm like, oh, really? I'm from California. I grew up in Sacramento. I went to school in San Diego. You know, and now it's literally just shifted about me, right? And we think that's like a great way to build rapport. No, instead of saying, making it and shifting it about me, I, said, I could say, oh, California? I might say what part, right? You'd say, Yosemite. I go, Yosemite? And then you would say, yeah, Yosemite, we, I grew up there. I take my kids there. We'd camp there every, you know, every year you know, or, or, what, or we, we grew up in, you know, San Diego. And I, now I get a chance to learn about you and your family, you know, just all of these things. My point is it's great communication to make it about the other person. And the more you make it about the other person, the more you probably will care more because you actually have cool things to care about because they're telling you about cool things rather than trying to be like, make it interesting about me. So what mirroring and labeling does without having to ask a ton of questions and feeling like someone's being interrogated, is it simply allows a safe space for people to emotionally share even more and you emotionally connect. So that, that to me is just so powerful with my kids, with my, with my, my wife, with my friends. Just to remind everybody, head over to brettswartz.com. Again, that's going to be a clickable link in the show notes. If you found some value in what we're talking about here so far, do us a quick favor and share this with one of your investor friends. So Brett, you know, when you're talking about these things, this takes a lot of practice, what we're talking about here. And at first it's going to feel extremely awkward and you're going to stumble and you're going to do, how do, how do, what would you recommend somebody do to develop this muscle? Okay, so I'm going to break it down exactly what I did and how it helped me to negotiate some of the best exits in the last 24 months that literally my business was on the line and it was going to go one way or the other. And instead of giving to fear and living in what I felt like wouldn't be an integrity to stay in this relationship, I was able to move to freedom and total relief. And imagine the 500 pound backpack on your back, right? And you're just like, uh, you know, so I think the first thing is vision, vision for what it could be, you know, when you're out of whatever that you're in or vision of how great it could be, even how much better it could be. So have that vision, right? So what I started to do is I practically would listen to, and this is the master class, Chris Foss, download the master class app. I think it's like 170 bucks a year. They have like, you know, Steph Curry, Chris Voss, they have... Coach K from Duke, they have Mark Cuban. I mean, they have amazing world-class people. So those, Chris Voss just has a couple on there. So I would just start listening. And then so I would listen and I would, you know, my workout in the morning and it would come to mind some question that he would ask or the way that he would say it. And I would write it down and I'd go to my notes, I'd write it down. And I was having these calls pretty, you know, every couple of weeks through these, through the six month period of time. And then I just start practicing it. And so part of it became a little bit of gamesmanship because I found myself in the same position, all of a sudden the high emotion, the lots of talking and the constant just, let's just say emotional, like little jabs and like, you know, things. And I remember like the heart rate, I'd put my phone on mute. Okay. Put my phone on mute and I would breathe and I did, he just kept talking. I just remember he just kept talking and I would just breathe in and I would breathe out, like literally just doing like breath work while he's just going and going and going and going and going. And then I'd have my questions or not questions. I'd have my labeling and mirroring ready to go. And I'd be taking some notes, you know, on the side as he's going and taking some detailed notes. And then finally there would be the space. And then I would just literally read it. And it helped me to lower my heart rate, lower my emotion and not agree or disagree. Just literally label it. Cause here's the reality. Nothing's a fire drill. And the other side typically wants to make it a fire drill. And if they're trying to make it a fire drill, they might be manipulating you, right? And if they're manipulating you, it's probably not someone you can trust. But most things in life are not fire drills, 
right? And the more someone's talking, the more likely that they really don't believe what they're saying and or they're trying to push something over. So, and, and they don't give you just like a direct answer. It's likely they're not being fully honest or they're being completely dishonest. And so, yeah, those are my practices. I would also go, my wife and I had a funny story. I was the entrepreneur. You share the stuff with the spouse. The spouse is, she's kind of not into it. But I'm like, okay, we're going to go. We're, we're searching for a car. We, we moved to Florida. We're going to buy a car. The car sales, <laughs> and we sit down. And uh, I use a little bit of the negotiation stuff. It's called the accusations audit, where you're basically saying something. You're trying to prepare them for what you're about to say that they're not going to like. And it's super awkward. That's probably one of the most awkward ones. But I'm like, I'm going to try this. It's a low stake thing. I was like, I may or may not buy this vehicle. Or sitting there like, you know, I don't know if you're going to like what we're real, willing to pay for this vehicle. I, and I don't want to waste your time. And I just want to make sure that you don't feel like we're trying to take advantage of the car dealership. My wife is sitting there like, she's the complete introvert. And she's completely just embarrassed. But she can't say anything because we're sitting down at the table after we test drive the Ford Expedition, right? And he's like, just say it. Like, you're not going to bother me. But I kept trying to build it up because that's what Chris says to do. Finally, I deliver the prize. And he's like, no, we can't do that. It didn't really work, but it was super awkward. And then we left there. We went and bought a vehicle like down the road and it worked out for the one that we bought. Right. But the point of all that is I think you got to be willing to jump in and just, just try it. It's going to be awkward. Practice it in low stake positions. And then it becomes more natural as you're in higher stakes positions. So that would be my feedback for people. Yeah. You know, it's kind of funny you shared that story because we were in a similar situation just recently. You, 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 you catch yourself using some of these strategies or techniques in, in every, every day. I thought it was kind of funny is by the time we got back from our test drive, I knew how the, the salesperson was incentivized. I knew how important the sale was for their end of the month quota. And it wasn't like me asking these questions point blank. It was just, they were offering it up just based on the series of qu events. A hundred percent, right? That's the neat part. And it, it, it doesn't have to be, oh, because I got this information, I'm going to use it against you. It's more like, now that I know this information, let's find a creative way to help both of us win in an equitable way as best we can. It's never going to be fair. There's always going to be a side of maybe gets a little bit more. It's never going to be exactly equal, but it can be a win-win if you can get creative in the solution that you guys can come. And really it's about trying to come alongside someone shoulder to shoulder versus, you know, face to face, right? Face to face feels like more like it's we're, we're combative versus, hey, let's see this from the same side of the table. And let's look at this and let's look for some creative options to choose and look at. And that's about trying to slow down. You know, the Bible says, be quick to listen, slow to speak and slow to become angry. It helps tremendously with this. Because I've got to like s slow it down and, you know, quick to listen, slow to speak, and hopefully don't become angry at all. You know, there's times to become angry and there's time that anger can move you if it's moving you in the right direction. But I think that is the piece of it that helps you emotionally to get a more of a level space. And again, it doesn't feel like you have to respond positive or negative. It gives you a chance to come in very neutral without having to make a major decision or say something that all of a sudden that now becomes the baseline for the next part of the negotiation. Instead, it's like, no, nope, let me mirror and label this. And then the next piece would be dynamic silence. This is really key. Dynamic silence can magnify the impact of your mirrors and labels. Additionally, use dynamic si silence to let it sink in. Let it sink in. People might walk away from a good deal if they feel they've been treated unfairly. Anticipate your counterpart's demand for fairness. Dynamic silence, after saying no, let it stand. So let that really sink in. And this demonstrates that you stand by your word. Dynamic silence can also increase fear of loss without having to make direct threats to your counterparts. So after you deliver great labels or great mirrors or in combinations, just be quiet. And I remember sitting and being quiet and it felt really awkward. Usually it takes about seven seconds honestly, for the brain to actually catch up to what someone just said. So that's just something to think about. Seven seconds. So if you can count to seven in your brain, and it's really awkward. Like if we sat here for seven seconds, it'd be awkward. But mm -hmm. that's sometimes what it takes. And then that person might say something, okay? And then they might go down another thing and then you might mirror and label that as well. And you just keep building on mirrors and labels, especially if you feel like the person is 
not being necessarily truthful or fully transparent. And especially if you feel like they're pressuring you to have to make a decision right now, you just keep doing that. And I'd say, hey, wow, it really sounds and feels like, you know, this is really meaningful to you. Hey, I'm, I'm really sorry. I'm out of time right now. I'd be happy to, to continue the conversation. I just, I need to jump on this next call here. How about we pick this up tomorrow? I remember ending it with this. And perhaps tomorrow, I could spend a little bit of time sharing my experience. This conversation was three people on the call. And it was so well-placed because two of us just sat there for probably 55 minutes of the 60 minutes. And the other person just talked. And so we came to the very end of it. And it's like jujitsu when I did it, it was like I was able to turn the leverage back because we had literally just listened. I was respectful. I didn't react. I didn't fight. I just respectfully asked if we could continue the conversation at a later time. And if that conversation would be one day to hear, which was really neat about it. The second person who was listening to me jumped up right away. It was like, yes, absolutely, Brett. Sorry, you weren't, but basically apologizing to the other person who was on their side. Sorry that you weren't able to, you know, really be heard. I hear what you're saying. The other person was talking the entire time and dominated everything. We'll jump on another call with you. And now the leverage had turned, the power dynamic had turned. And because I was respectful, because I mirrored and labeled, because I actually heard them, I didn't try to fight or combat. So we get on the call the next day or two days later or whatever, and they actually do hear me, right? And I'm actually able to lay it out succinctly what's going on. And so the negotiation now shifted and it was great. So that would be my encouragement to everyone listening is realize that sometimes you might have a single conversation, but you can't fit in A to Z in a single conversation. Sometimes it might just be A, B, C, and that's okay. Doesn't mean you can't have the next conversation at a different date to keep moving forward. Yeah, that it, that's really like one of those things that's the hardest thing to get used to is being uncomfortable in those silences. It, and it is, and it, there's no shaking that no matter how long you practice this, it, it is going to feel awkward. It's going to be uncomfortable, but giving that time for everybody to have that breath is, is extremely powerful and important and things will be brought to your attention and, and said that you, you probably wouldn't have uncovered just by asking more questions. You just got to let yeah. everybody have a, have a second. Absolutely. And also, I had another intense one just about a month ago. And there was like a big event, high emotions, high stakes. And I mirrored and labeled just to slow myself down. And then I gave myself about 60 days to even go back. I mean, I sent an email and said I would follow back up. Gave myself 60 days to process everything that had happened. Right. And so you understand that it's not just in a silo. And so knowing that if you're in an emotional state, that's not going to be productive, that you've got to be willing to give yourself time. And now, and that's hard for me because I'm the type of person, Jack, that wants to, like, if there's a problem, like, I want to go solve it now, like today. You know, I don't want to have it lingering. So it's not easy for us. Other people are like, there's a problem. They run from the conflict. They're like, I don't want to face it. Each of them are, you know, each extreme is not great because the one that wants to solve it now, well, guess what? The other person may not be ready to solve that, right? And the person who doesn't want to solve it or even face it at all, just sweep it under the rug, you got to solve it. So there's someplace in the middle, right? So knowing that and sensing where emotionally the relationships are at and what would be the wise time, like so the question that we asked yourself would be this. Given our history, given where I want this relationship to go, given the current circumstances, What's the wise thing to do, right? Again, given our history, given the cir current circumstances and given where, where I want this to go, what's the wise thing to do today? And sometimes the wise thing to do today is to not have that conversation right away, right? To mm -hmm. give yourself emotional time for the emotions to go back from seeing red back to the more of an even state of emotion where you can prepare your mirrors and labels, where, you know, for me, it's prayer, for me, it's meditation, it's, it's visualizing, it, a ton of prayer, and then writing down my thoughts, writing down the things, thinking about, hey, from their perspective, like where, what could they, what could it be? Also coming with an open heart to say, how do I play a role in this? Like, what could I have done differently to approach this in a way that perhaps I'm not seeing? 
asking for wise counsel and getting their perspective on it. And then boom, collectively coming back and, and now engaging in the conversation, you know, asking for the right to, to share what happened and if they were be open to that. And now you're in it. So that, that would be the other thought too. It does take the prep. It does take, to me, took a lot of prep to, for these really high stake ones. And that's the hard part sometimes is having the patience to do the prep. Mm -hmm. You know, and one of those simple tactics, frankly, is something that I do. I, I do it on a daily basis because I, you'd have a tendency of responding, whether it's email or text or, you know, with Microsoft Teams and Slack, and you got all of these things coming at you. More times than not, I will type out my response and not send it right away. I'll go do something else for a minute, come back to it, make some changes before sending it because sending out of reaction is just a terrible idea. Absolutely love that. And by the way, to add to that, I do the exact same thing. And sometimes I actually never send it. And just the fact of journaling helps me. In fact, 60 days ago when I had that really intense one, I wrote up this entire email of all the reasons why I was right and they're wrong and blah, 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 and all the things. I remember praying about it, thinking about it, asking my wife and my mentor about it. And they're like, that's not the email. I'm like, oh man, I really wanted it to be the email. You know, like that's not the email to send. Actually bless them, thank them. You're moving on regardless, you're moving on, right? The values weren't aligned. You're moving on, bless them, thank them. Now, by the way, it only takes 2% of, of values being off to ruin the whole thing, right? And that's what unfortunately happened. The values weren't aligned and it crushed it, but 98% was amazing. And I do love and care for these people, right? So it's like, focus on that, especially when you're in that high emotional state, take the high road, right? Pray for them, bless them, thank them. Don't take the low road, right? Because oftentimes if what you did was right, by you taking the low road can justify what they did. And that's the tough part. Like you don't want to do that and or give them license to do it again. Instead, you're not going to change their heart or probably change their mind. That's the, you know, they ch just chose to do the thing they did. But if you pray for them, bless them, especially in that high stakes emotional state, move into a space, you know, for me, it took me 60 days. And then come back and then mirror and label and work through it. You know, we've been able to respectfully reconcile the personal relationships, business relationship, the official one has ended, but this new fresh chapter has opened up. And I learned a lot. I learned a ton, by the way. That's also a thing. Like, look at these things as like, these are opportunities. That didn't happen to me. It happened for me. I had an amazing education on so many things, right? And I had a chance to practice these intense conversations using Chris Voss's stuff. And I'm stronger for it now. I'm better for it. So I think that also is something to really focus on as well, the positives. Well, this has been fantastic. I can't thank you enough, Brett, for these conversations. We could continue this conversation because there's all kinds of content here. And I think you've kind of convinced me to join this masterclass. I haven't, I hadn't gone that far yet. I, if there's one thing I've ever read or listened to or gone through, like, this is the top of the list. Like, besides the Bible, this is it. Like, you got the Bible, and I feel like this is the next one. Like, it's so great. It's so practical, and it's so applicable, right? Especially in today's age, right? Where communication and high stakes and, oh, man, emotions are running high. You know, we're in an election year. Like, you can make your point, right? You can win the argument, but you're probably not going to make a difference, right? And so learning to mirror and label just frees you from feeling like you've got to be heard and you've got to make your point. I really encourage everyone to check it out. But I'm still trying to learn like how to do an email. That's the thing that's kind of like perplexing to me because I'm still trying to learn that. I wonder if we can have another show once I learn that to come back on that. Like this is like verbal. Sometimes I'll speak in the chat GPT. I'll say, hey, chat GPT, help me to be like Chris Foss. Notice what the difference, mirroring labeling. Help me to come up with some questions based upon this scenario. And I'm literally talking into my phone and, and chat GPT. And I click go and then it gives me some outlines that could help you with not only emails, but also with talking points. Yeah, no, that's, that's definitely worthwhile. Again, I'm going to repoint everybody to your website, Brett. Head over to brettswartz.com. That's going to be a clickable link in the show notes. Before we jump into the rapid fire questions, is there a question or concept you wished we would have covered here today? No, I think we did a good job on that. We can jump into the rapid fire. What lie do real estate investors tell themselves and sometimes to others? I think it's either too hard or it's never been done before. The self-doubt is probably the biggest lies. I think, you know, identity, vision for where we're going, what we're about. 
I think the enemy wants to attack our identity and the, it, it will make a difference. It will make an impact. It's always about those things, whether you're a real estate investor or an entrepreneur, it goes back to the identity, right? And so I think the, you know, when the leader grows, you know, when the leader gets better, everything gets better, right? So I think that the, the counter to that is knowing who you are, knowing whose you are and knowing where you're going, right? And why you're going there and continually remind yourself because yeah, the world will promise you one thing and they'll spin you around and they'll spit you out, right? And so are your values based upon what they are saying you are or who you are or what you're doing or is it something bigger? And so I would say that that's the number one lie I think that any real estate investors is probably facing. Do you have a book recommendation or what are you reading right now? Yeah, so there's a book called The Awe of God, John Brevere, and I just saw him speak about uh, two weeks ago in Colorado. And if you're a Christian, if you're not a Christian, I think it's a great read. If you're a Christian, you know, I grew up as a Christian, I'm a Christian. In studying, like when you hear the fear of God, I think that, that a lot of people have a misconception of that. I, I think I did too. It's like, oh, I, I'm scared of God. Well, I think it's it, the, the actual thing that really breaks down is really great about this book is it's the fear of being away from God or the fear of being away from his wisdom and his word, his ways, right? Like that it's... It's, that's different than like, I'm afraid, you know? And so it's a dynamic like thought, but I haven't really ever thought about it. I'm reading it back a second time. It's so powerful. Then I saw John speak. So the awe of God's incredible. And then if you want a business book, anything by John Maxwell and the leadership and communication, he's got the high road leader. I saw him speak at a conference about two months ago and he just talks about taking the high road in today's leadership environment, especially you know, politically or just worldwide. It's just, we have a leadership crisis, right? So figuring out ways to take the high road and how to practically do that. It's a really powerful book called High Road Leaders by John Maxwell. If you could go back in time and give your younger self one piece of advice, what would that be? So learn to work harder on myself than I do on my job. If I work hard on my job, I'll make a living. If I work harder on yourself, you'll make a fortune. And this is by Jim Rohn. And the focus is not just to make money. Oh, that's really cool because you can make a big impact and help a lot of people. The focus is being a great steward with what the good Lord has given me, right? My health, my finances, my family, my faith, leadership, personal development, and just maximizing the days, the hours, the weekends, the time to maximize that potential to make a bigger impact for more people. So just being more intentional about those major areas of my life having a plan and a plan is not just an idea or a thought, but the plan in action is putting it on the calendar and then disciplining yourself to stay to that calendar. And I'm talking planning out one year, two year, three year, five year. What's my perfect life numbers in three years or five years? What's my perfect life numbers in 30 years? And just being so intentional about that because time is the one thing that just seems to go by so fast. And finally, what single strategy, process, or tool have you implemented that has had the biggest time-saving impact to your business? Yeah, right now it's ChatGPT for sure. And kind of what we said before, literally speaking into it like the, the little microphones and quickly asking it to draft an email or draft notes or draft whatever, just get the first draft going. And then on my web browser, I just refresh it. And now what I had on my phone is on my web browser that I'm copying and pasting and I'm going, I'm moving. So ChatGPT, I bought the $20 a month version and it's super quick, it's super efficient, it organizes it. So I would say if you're not doing that, you're probably losing out a lot of time right now. <laughs> well, Brett, this has been fantastic. One last time, you can learn more at brettswartz.com. That's going to be a clickable link in the show notes, but really appreciate your time, Brett. I hope you'll come back again, maybe this time a little sooner. Absolutely, Jack. Thanks for having me.